Say, I'm a world changer. Come on, say, I'm a world changer. I know you're probably thinking, you said that the last four Sundays. We're doing this again? Yes, because our world needs changing. Amen? Amen? Come on. Our world needs, it needs you. It needs some change, and there's just so much going on in our world today, and uh, we, we need each other. It, well, here's, here's, here's a way you can change your world. You can invite people to church. That is the easiest way. Help us build the house. We got a, we got a few extra seats in the house. Help us build the house. Be a part of what God is doing here. Invite your neighbors, and maybe, maybe they won't come. And Invite them to join online and, and be a part of service online. And, and build the house because our world needs Jesus. Amen? So the la- last Sunday we were, we were looking at the, the, a little bit of Jonah. I think we covered the first and second chapter of the story of Jonah. What an incredible, almost unbelievable story that this man disobeyed God. Because <laughs> we would never do that. I know y- y'all thought I was going to say it was, it was just incredible that there was a whale that ate the dude. But, uh, I mean, if you fell off a boat, you know, you're just fish food. But uh, that we disobey God. Ha- ha- don't raise your hand, but uh, sometimes, right? Sometimes we disobey God. And, uh, but what a loving Savior that, that sent that fish and scooped him up. And so we're going to pick it up today in Jonah chapter 3 and uh, jump in there in just a few minutes. But before we do, I want, to, uh, I, want to, I want to go back to the very first message that I shared about this. And there was a statement that, I, that, I, that God just had me put in there. And this statement is, before, before we can ever be a world changer... We must first allow God to change our world. Let me say that again. Before I can change someone else's world, I have to first let God change this world. This thing going on right here. This Gary thing that gets in the way. Before I'm ever going to be able to reach anybody else, I have to let God reach me first. He has to change me first. If he doesn't change me, then I have no testimony. If I'm, if I'm just like everybody else, if there's nothing different in me than what everybody else is, then I, can't, I, I don't speak from a place of change, and then no one is going to be changed. Amen? I mean, if, if the disciples weren't changed, they wouldn't have changed the world. And, you know, for the first couple of weeks of the series, we, we talked about them. And, and then we kind of we moved on to, to Jonah because last week we talked about, you know, the disobedience in his life and, and how it's, it's, you know, it just hinders. When, we, when we're disobedient, it just hinders the work of God. In, in many ways, it stops the, the work of God. And so let me say, let me give you a couple just, you know, little uh, ground-laying things. You could be in the house of God, but not have the heart of God's house. Let me say that again. You can be in the house, but not have the heart of the house. In other words, you can show up at church, but church has got to show up in you. Are you with me? If we're going to change the world, now, if you don't want to change the world, you can just come to church and, you know, just, you know, tip the offering and, you know, come once a month and, and call yourself a Christian and you, you can do all that. But if you want to change the world, it has to start here. And so you can, you can come to church, but just coming to church does not make you a world changer, amen? We can be engaged in the work of God but not allow God to work in us. This happens all the time. They call it, they call it church burnout. You, 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 you're always teaching a class. You're, you know, you're always doing something. You're, you're involved in the work of God, but if, you're, if, the, if God's work is not in you, then you could easily fall by the wayside. Amen? Are we, are, we, are we getting somewhere yet? This is making sense to you. We can be engaged in the work of God, but we have to also la- allow God to work in us. I want you to tap yourself right here and say, God, work in me. Come on, say, God, do a work in me. I hope you guys at home, I hope you're playing along. It, it's much more fun if you'll just kind of just act like you're here. It just kind of makes it, I hope you dress up. I hope you're not sitting at home in your pajamas. <laughs> Even though I probably would be in my pajamas, well... That's another whole story. We won't even go there. But anyway, 
Yeah. So what I want to share with you today, at first I was kind of talking more about worship when I was putting notes together. And I began, so, th- so this week I, I got to work on a project and um, love working on stuff. I just, I just love the economy. Anybody ever do something and you just like sit back? Maybe it's just mowing the yard, you know, and, or just doing the dishes, you know. Just I know you, I won't bring up laundry because, you know, you never get the laundry all done, right? But there's just something about that sense of accomplishment. And I, so this, this last week I got to work, and, and, uh, and we're working on a shower. And uh, as I was working, you know, part of – so this is not like just putting a tub in. You know, a tub just automatically drains. This is like building, like pouring the concrete to get the slope right so that when you're in the shower, after eventually it's going to be tiled, and, and, then, and then when the water comes on, the water has to run toward the drain. And so every part of this shower, and it's like a five-foot by three-foot wide shower, and every part of this has to, has to, has to it, it's, it, it's directing the water to the drain. Are you with me? So Because you've been in a shower probably once in your life when something was plugged up. And your toes are getting, you're standing in water, right? That's just gross, right? So, uh, yeah, so uh, as I was working on this thing, I, I just began to just sense in my spirit just the, the flowing of water and how all you have to do to get water to flow is become low. All it takes to get water from here to there is to make there lower than here. Are you with me? I mean, it's just basic science. God's ability to move water from the top of a mountain down to the bottom of the valley, we just take it for granted. And and, and I begin to see something this week about how important it is that we learn how to become low. How? Because the Bible talks about that the Spirit of God, he says, in the last day, I will pour, everybody say pour, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Have you ever been at church and you're just leaving your life, man, that was the best service ever, and somebody else leaves and goes, well, I ain't ever going back there. That was, that was a dull service. It very well could be the person that left that said it was dull had no expect, expectation on the service, and they didn't have a low spot for the spirit to run to. They, 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 they had maybe exalted themselves above what God was doing. And so it's, it, I, just, I, just, I just felt so impressed this week uh, in my own personal life to become low, to get lower than I've ever been. And, you know, in our world today, what we hear about is exalt yourself, right? You know, you got to have some you time. It's all about you. It's all, you know, you know, making sure, you know, you're, be the best you can be. And there's, there's nothing really wrong with, with being the best you can be, but we got to come to the terms of, of the, we got we to realize that the best I can be is down here. The most useful I will be in the kingdom of heaven is when people don't see me, but they see the flood of, of, of the heavenly water that run the Spirit of God that runs to me. And so the question is, are you attracting God's Spirit? And I, as I was thinking on this this week, it took all week to build this shower. All we got was the slope. Well, we did other things, but, you know, you got to get concrete right, and then it's not right, and just, uh, just a big deal. I, I realized... These 56-year-old knees don't like being in this position very long, right? But when I was in this position and I was hurting and my knees were aching and my back is sore, I just heard God whisper over my shoulder, that's where I like you the best, in that low position. You know, we're so so easily distracted about things of God. And as I was just meditating on just this simple thought of how water flows, I began to have this urgency in my heart to talk to us today about how important it is that we, can, we learn how to get in God's presence without somebody else taking us there. 
Let me say that again. That we can, that we know how to get low on Monday when we don't have the praise band. Where, where would our worship be? Where, where would it be? Where, is, it, is it possible that you couldn't worship God without Spotify playing your favorite three songs? What if you were like David and you had to go make your own harp and learn how to play it yourself and write your own song? See, what's going to happen in the world when when Facebook is shut down completely? What's going to happen in the world when there's no more internet to go and, and hear your favorite preacher? What's going to happen when there's not a conference that you can go to and and get a word from God? What we've got to learn how to do is we've got to learn how to become the word of God. We've got to learn how to get in God's presence ourselves that we can find him without everything, without all the, 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 the fanciness of it. Is it possible that we've gotten so accustomed to coming to church that when somebody says to you, we've got to learn how to worship God, the first thing we think of is a song in a church building instead of our life sold out to Him. Remember last week, I told you that obedience is the greatest form of worship you will ever take to the throne. Your obedient life to him when it looks like it's crazy and he says to you, I need you to make a left turn at the end of the block and you're like, I don't know where that goes so I'm not going to make that left turn. Is that disobedience or is it more than that? Is it possible that it, it is an ungrateful and an untrusting spirit that won't allow you to be subject to the king? You see, our worship is when we go to God and say, Everything making a left turn scares me to death, but I know you, and I trust you, so I will follow you. You see, that, that's saying, God, you're in charge, not me. That's that place of, I'm going to have to dig a little hole right here in my, in my plan. I'm going to have to dig a little hole right here in, 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 my, in, my, in, my, in my ideology of what's what. I'm going to have to be okay with being wrong. <laughs> I'm going to get low. You see, so, so let, let me get to this story. Jonah chapter 3, I'm just going to read this 1 through 10. I'll, I'll kind of go back and make some points. Jonah chapter 3, Jonah is only four chapters. After the fourth chapter, we don't even hear of Jonah again. But you get to Jonah chapter Jonah chapter 1, Jonah disobeys God. Jonah chapter 2 is his time in the well. Jonah chapter 3, look at this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, <laughs> saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, if you weren't here last week when it says he arose and went to Nineveh, you got to realize how he got there because he was on a boat. Remember last week, he was on a boat going the wrong way. And then they threw him overboard. And then a great big fish swallowed him up and spit him out on the shore of Nineveh. So when it says he went to Nineveh, he he just kind of got put there. And then the word of the Lord came to him the second time and said, go to Nineveh and and cry out against this city. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. In other words, it would take somebody three days just to walk from the north side of the city to the south side. It was three days of walking. Some of y'all, we get tired of going to the mailbox. Just, just think about how, I, I know you probably don't think, I don't think I could get very far, but if you were in dis, decent shape, you could make it quite a journey in three days. They say that Nineveh was the largest city of its day. In Nineveh's heyday, it was the largest city there ever was. Let's go on. It was a great city. Three days' journey in the breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, 
Yet 40 days, this is what God told him to tell him. Yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believe God. Everybody say, believe God. I don't know about you, but if somebody's just walking down my street saying, in three days, you know, fire's going to fall. I'd be like, that's a nut right there, right? <laughs> yeah. But they believed God. They called, they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And this is where I want to get to. Verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh. Everybody say the king. And he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And And he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king, this is what he published, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we would not perish, may not perish. Verse 10, love this verse. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster, and he said, he relented of the disaster that he had said he would do unto them, and he did not do it. So because of them turning their heart, God changed his mind. But I want you to look at this king. Here is the king of Nineveh. And it says, depending on the trance, most of them they say he arose from his throne. It doesn't mean he just got up. It means he got off of his throne. He got off of his place of power. He got off of his place of authority. He got off of his throne. He resigned. He resigned as being the king of his life. I I, I, I just want to challenge us. If we're going to change the world, And I might just be talking to one or two people. Some of you might just be like, man, if I just get to heaven, that'll be good enough for me. I hope that's not your mentality, because if it is, you're missing the whole point. Christianity, if you're a Christian, it's not just so you can make it to heaven. If that was the case, the moment you gave your heart to God, poof, he would just shoot you right to heaven. We got another one. That's not the point. The point is that we can change our world. And so here is this king, and he resigns. I don't, I don't even know how to, I don't know how to adequately describe what it would be like for a king to get off of his throne. Because when a king gets off his throne, it, what it means is anybody, any, any fake kings, any wannabe kings could jump up on it. This is not, you know, this is not the time of, of elections. This is not, you know, we, we have a peaceful transfer of power, whatever that looked like this year. But anyway, uh, it's, it's not like that here. This is, if the king gets sick, there's going to be another king that's going to pop right up and take him out. If a king gets weak, if he shows any, any form of weakness, there's going to be another, another, another power that's going to exalt himself. And this king, he, he, he has the nerve to hear the word of God just from a rumor, just from somebody else. We don't, we don't know that he heard Jonah say it, but he got off of his throne. I just wonder, I just wonder when we're going to get off of our throne. I just wonder when we're going to quit being in charge of our lives. I've, I've made a mess of some things in my life. And I can tell you it's when I was in charge. Amen? There, there's a common denominator in every failure in my life. There's this, there's this troublemaker that keeps showing up. Every time, every time there's something wrong in my life, Guess who's, guess who's involved? Me. I, 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 am, I am my own worst enemy. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? And, and every time you make a mistake, every time you do that thing that you said you would never do again, it's always you. I just wonder how much more freeing and how much more God can do with us if he didn't have to go through the bureaucracy of the kingship 
that we've placed in our own life. Our opinion, our attitude, our, our thought process. Well, that's not the way I see it. The God of our imagination versus the God of the King, the King of Kings. I just wonder how much more God can do if we would just get off of the throne. He, he resigned as the King of his life. And I put in my notes, you must resign as the king of your life. I must resign as the king of my life or I will never be a part of God's kingdom. If I want to be the king, I can't be the king in God's kingdom. If I, if, the, 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 the New Testament says things like this. If you want to be great, be the least. If you want to be the, 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 if you want to be the leader of all, be the servant of all. In other words, Quit trying to be big and start being small. Get to a place where, you know what, God, I trust you. We we are in unprecedented times. I I can can imagine all kinds, just by reading the book of Revelation, you you can see where we're headed. But just in the last few days of of our new president, laws have changed in a moment with the swipe of a pen. Freedoms and things that we've held dear is changing rapidly. This is not a time for us to exalt ourselves, but a time to exalt Him. Now, let let me say this to you. You can't make God any bigger than He is. You've got to understand that. Look at that person next to you and say, God's all right by Himself. Say, He don't need you. right? He, 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 He needs you in His kingdom, but you can't make Him any bigger. The Bible says things like, 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 that, like the, the earth is his footstool. It, it talks about the size, of, the, the span of his hand is the, is the Milky Way. It, 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 there's just these descriptions of how big, you can't, my point is, you can't make God bigger. But what you do is you make yourself smaller. Da- David put it, I love this, and you hear, you'll hear me say this all the time. David said, come magnify the Lord with me. Y'all remember that? He said, come magnify the Lord with me. He wasn't saying, I'm going to make God bigger. He's saying, I'm going to be smaller. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit magnifying my problems. I'm going to quit magnifying me. How many times does I and me come up in our conversation? I want this. I think that. Me, 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 me. We got we to gotta, we gotta start lifting him up. God, what do you want? The greatest way to get low before God is to say, God, not my will but yours be done. He got off his throne. We must become low so that he can become great. He's already great, but for him to be great in your life, we must become less. God is always greater and larger than you. Let me say that again. God is greater and larger than you. So here's a question. Why don't we trust him? <laughs> Let me, I, I'll quit picking on you. Why don't I trust him more? Why don't I, why, we, we, why is there always a rub when God says do this and it's something I don't want to do? It's so easy for us to sit here in 2021 and pick on Jonah for going the wrong way on purpose. But we all do the same thing. This king, this heathen king, hears that God is coming to destroy him, and his answer is, you can have my seat. Take my authority. Take, take, take my, 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 uh, my reign. Take the things that I'm in charge. Oh, if we could just put God in charge. If we could truly just put God in charge. I know we, we feel like we do. We, you know, we... We, we go to church, you know, once a week, sometimes. Well, if it's not, if it's not too sunny, because if it's sunny, you know, I got stuff I got to do outside. And, and, but I'll go on the, well, I don't really go on the rainy days either because I'll get wet. And then when it's cold, you know, I mean, I might as well go to church because it's too cold to do anything else, but then I got to get cold. 
And, and so we get in this, we get in this process. Before you know it, we've missed half the year, and, and that's just the minimum of showing up on a Sunday. I, I don't know if you remember, but the, the Bible says in, in, in the Ten Commandments, keep the Sabbath holy. In Hebrews, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. As the custom of some is, even so more come together as you see him approaching. But this message is not to try to build church attendance. Because there's coming a day when church attendance, what we see here, won't even be a thing. There's coming a day when church will be on your street with that little revival that broke out in your living room. It'll be that book of Acts going house to house. It'll be that that thing of, you know, we can't go to church anymore. I mean, we, we got a taste of that a few months ago. Y'all remember that? That happened in your lifetime. Wasn't that, wasn't that kind of spooky? That just like that? I mean, just that quick? Just oh, we, we always thought it was going to be because there was going to be like armed guards and they'd be like, no, you believe in Jesus, you can't come to church. No, it wasn't even something that big. It was just a little tiny bug, a virus that you have a 98, 99% chance of surviving. And we ran away and hid. Why? Because for the most part, he is not the king. We are. This king has the nerve to say, God, I'm going to put you in charge. This is, this is one way we worship God. We humble ourselves, acknowledging him as the final authority. That's saying, not my will, but yours. The second thing this king does, he does like four things. I just want to, I just want to highlight a couple of those. The first one is he gets off the throne. The second one is he completely changes his garment. You know, in, in, in our world today, I don't know if you have ever gone to a formal thing. I'm very uncomfortable going to formal things. If I can't wear tennis shoes, if, 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 if there's like a dress code, I just get, I mean, now I clean up good. Don't misunderstand me. I can put a suit on with the best of them, right? And you should shake your head. Praise God, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I am, I don't know, there's just something about those little thin pants I, it just it just feels weird. Don't feel right, you know. I got to have some structure, some jeans on me, right? Yeah. And so, but this this king, he changes his garment. I, I, in our world today, people would judge you by the clothes you wear. They will judge you. They will judge your inside by what you're putting on the outside. They will look at you and say, well, that's a successful person because look at that bling. Look at this. Look at that. Oh, I know those jeans, and I, I see those tennis shoes and, and, and that wristwatch and, and all those adornments that we can put on our outside to try to some. And, and we, a lot of times we don't even mean. It's not like we're trying to dress up the inside, but people will judge you by what's on the outside. Amen? And if you don't believe that, you just try to go to a fancy, back when you could, remember back when you could go to restaurants back in the day? Yeah, back, back, back when we were kids, you know, you would tell your grandkids, man, we, we actually went out to eat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so people, if, if you try to go to a fancy restaurant, I remember once, I, I was with my sister, she lives in Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, and there was this, this restaurant, and, uh, and she told me, and a couple, she had her two sons, and, and, uh, she told me, make sure you wear a tie. And so I wore a tie because she told me to. Her husband wore a tie. Her boy wore a tie, two boys. We get to this restaurant. We walk in, and when they seated us at the, at the table, before you could even flinch, they pulled out this great big pair of scissors and chopped off the tie. <laughs> whole thing was set up. Now, I... It was fine with me. I, you don't, may not know this about me. I can tie a tie. I can do a double wins or not. I don't know if you knew that. Probably, you know, it's the little things about Gary that you don't really care about. Uh, for five years, from eighth grade to, to the time I graduated, every single day of the school year, I wore a tie to school. I know. A tie, not a clip-on. Oh, no. Not, no we, we weren't, you know, this is a real tie. And so I, I, am, I am not, this, this is... This is dressed up for me right here. 
you know, there's a T-shirt underneath this. As soon as church is over, this shirt's coming off because it's got this collar. And this thing will rub on me. And I don't like that at all. I like comfy clothes. I, I, there's probably no tag in this shirt because if it's rubbing on me, it's got to go. It's just not going to be there. I just can't, just don't like that. I don't know. Is anybody else? There? Let me see their hands. Yeah, the tag has got to go. Yeah, ain't even going to be. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I digress. We are identified by what's on the outside. But God's looking at what's on the inside. And so here this king is. He takes off this robe, this exquisite, sometimes gold threads in it, animal fur, exotic. He takes it off. And when he takes it off, he has another garment underneath that's fancy too. And he takes that off until until he's just a man. If we're going to change the world, we we have to be dressed in the identity of him. The the only way we're going to really change the world is when people quit seeing you and start seeing him. Oh, that we would be identified with Christ. Oh, that we would be like Jesus in our look. And I'm not talking about, don't, don't go get no robe and grow a big, you know, fuzzy beard and be like, I'm just like Jesus. No, you're just weird is what that is, you know, wearing sandals all the time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that we would, that we would be identified, that, that people would, would see the good works that are coming out of you, that they would see the love coming out of you, that they would see the confidence that's in you, that they would see, the Bible says that the signs and wonders would follow those that believe. The only way that's going to happen, if you're looking for the fame, if you're looking for the glory, or if you're looking to not be identified as Christ, you will never change the world. Oh, that we could let him dress us in the appropriate attire. In, In this story, the king takes off all this clothing and he puts on a sackcloth. Sackcloth is just what it sounds like. It's the cheapest fabric they could come up with to make a cloth. I mean, to make to make a sack. So it's just cheap. You ever seen the the, the three legged races with the burlap, the toe toe sack? I don't know why they call it a toe sack. I don't know what. Maybe a potato. Maybe that. Maybe I just had a. Maybe that was it. I feel like I just had a moment right there. The potato sack toe. See. Anyway, yeah. If you've, I don't know if you've ever been around burlap, but if a tag's bugging me, burlap is out of the question, right? But he puts on this uncomfortable garment because he's going to find his comfort in him. That he, would, that he would quit looking to please himself, and instead, I'll wear whatever to please you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit being in charge of me that I can be in charge, not in charge of you, but that I can, I can be in subject to you. That whatever you say, God, that's what I want. He changed his garment. He chose not to be identified as the king. He gave up his role as being powerful. We are, we are identified by our outer garments, our uniforms that we wear. You see somebody, and, and you, if it's a police officer, you recognize them because they got the police officer outfit on, right? You, you see people with the, you know, the cowboy because he's got his boots, and even if he's driving a Buick and lives, you know, in an apartment, you know, he's, he looks like he could be a cowboy, right? And so, you know, it, it, anyway, we identify people by what they wear on the outside. What if in this last day what we need to really wear is some Jesus on the outside? Outside, that when I walk into Walmart, they identify Jesus in me, not because of who I am, but because of the Jesus that I've put on. Can, can I share a story with you? It was challenged on me this week. I was at a, a, going through a drive through getting some breakfast, and uh, we went to pay, and the, the guy said, oh, the person in front of you paid for yours. I'm like, praise God, hallelujah. It was like $5, you know. Praise God, hallelujah. And so then... You know, he says, do you want to pay for the guy behind you? I'm like, yeah, let's pay for his. Oh, how much is it? (laughs) That was my next question. You know, because there's a limited amount of funds, right? Are you with me? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. He might be buying for the band at school. I don't know, you know. And uh, sure enough, $27. I'm looking back. What in the world did he get? I'm in that moment of, ah. <laughs> yeah, I'll just give him the five that I was going to pay, you know. Right? I'll just, they paid for part of yours, you know. That was so uncomfortable. It was, it was like burlap, like, yeah, I don't really want to pay for his. But I felt like I needed to. You should have seen his headlights flashing as we were driving off. I mean, he was like flashing and honking the horn, and he's just like, and that made it all worth it. But I got to tell you, there was a moment when I was just like, yeah, I don't even know about, you know, I just, uh, you know, I get, that's like five days of breakfast right there, man. It's like free breakfast for a week, and I'm just giving it away. That's what I'm talking about, and I'm sure not saying that to, to toot my horn, because I, I'll be honest, I did not want to do that. But somehow I managed What if people saw in us Jesus? You see, his, the king's actions saved a nation. What he did by stepping off his throne and putting God there, by changing his garment and saying, I'm not going to be the king. I'm not going to be in charge. You're not even going to, don't even come to me for answers. Oh, that's a big deal. Isn't it true we always want people to come to us so we can feel important? The king's like, don't come to me for answers. We're going to go to him for the answer. He's the king. Oh, that we would establish that kind of kingship in our life, that people wouldn't, wouldn't look at us and say, oh, they got it all together, but they would look at you and say, oh, Jesus has got it all together in them. That they would look at us and they would know our story of the failure. They would know the pain. They would know the things that we've messed up. They would know the, the times that we've fallen. And they would say, well, if, if somehow they can make it through that, then, and they know it was God, well, we, we've got to quit, you know, stealing the glory from him. So then we get to Jonah chapter 4. And this is where the story turns. Jonah chapter 4, and then we're done. So the, let, let me read the end of Jonah chapter 3, just the last couple of verses. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, what they did, they, they turned. They, they got off their thrones. They changed their identity. They, they trusted him. When, when, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. There is a a religious spirit in this world that is going to cause such persecution against the church, against the sold-out believers, that it, that it is going to shock you. That when when you do good works for the kingdom and somebody gets healed, they're going to attack you. That when, when, when you reach out to somebody and you, 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 give, you buy their lunch, there's going to be people that are going to come against you. There, there is a religious spirit. It is a spirit of antichrist that is rising up in this world that is going to cause persecution on the church for doing what I've just described to you that we would do. That we would get off our throne. We would put the king on the throne. But I can assure you the enemy is going to come at you and tell you what a fool you are. How how ignorant you must be if you're going to trust the king. That there is a religious spirit that's coming against good, well-meaning Christians that, that take the time to read their word, that would dare go to God and say, God, I need you. That would, that would be, that would be li- looking in the word and seeking after the king and, and, and not elevating themselves but becoming low before him. There is going to be, and it's already happening, it has always been happening, there is a religious spirit that we're going to see more and more and more that's going to attack you like never before. But that is the time that we stand even more firm. Why? Because we're not in charge. I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to be the king anymore. When I'm the king, I know what happens. I mess it all up. But when he's the king, all I have to do is follow him. And there is such a freedom in that. Come on, somebody. If you've ever been in charge of anything, 
you know what's going to happen if it fails. They coming for you. Right? And so you carry that fear. You carry that, that, that burden. You carry that, that heaviness. But when you follow the king, that's why the Bible says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because my job is not to carry it. My job is to follow. And so sure, there's going to be an attack, but the attack isn't really against me because I'm dead. It's against the king. And here's the cool thing. That attack never wins against the king. Because remember, he is the king. And so here's Jonah. This is such a disturbing verse. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, now, let's, let's stop a second. I, I'm going to get you out of here. Don't worry. Jonah came there so that these people would be saved. But he didn't want them to be saved. This is the prophet of God that had, that had established himself as a king. He is the one that was still on his own throne. He said this is what God should do. This, God, God should bring fire on them. God should put judgment on them. God, there's going to be people in this last revival that's about to happen, that is already happening, that, that people are getting saved one day and will be preaching the next day. They're going to get baptized on a Saturday and be leading in the choir on a Sunday. And there's going to be people in the seat that are going to be saying, how dare they put that harlot on the stage? Why would they elevate them? It's because that person got off their own throne and God has elevated the goodness in them, the God in them. And we've got to be ready for that. Jonah said it displeased him exceedingly. He was angry and he prayed to the Lord. This is how angry he is. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Remember when Jonah chapter 1, God said go to Nineveh and he went the wrong way? He said, isn't this what I said when I was in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. And then there's a prophetic thing here. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Even in his sinful heart, even in his self-righteous heart, he was still prophesying the goodness of God. He says, he says but God, I knew you were a God of mercy. I knew you were a God that, that isn't quick to anger. I knew that you were a God abounding in... He didn't know that. He, he hadn't experienced that. He, he, all he knew was the God of the Old Testament, that when you messed up, the ground opened up and swallowed you. That's what He knew the God of the Old Testament, that when you're sinning, if there's enough of you sinning together, fire and brimstone's going to fly out of heaven and burn you up. That's the God he had seen, but the spirit in him knew of a God that was to come, a God of mercy, a God overflowing in goodness, a God, a God that, that is, is not just, let me, let me say this before, before you misunderstand, God is still a jealous God. God is still bringing judgment on this world. We need to be so thankful that we're in the, in the, in the dispensation of grace. But there is a day coming when, we will, when, 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 when us, those that are not covered in the blood of Jesus will be judged according to their works. But he's a God right now of mercy. He's a God of grace. And Jonah says, this is why I didn't want to tell these people to repent. Because I knew you would forgive them. Who does that sound like? That sounds like straight up the devil, don't it? That just sounds like the old enemy, the devil. When somebody gets saved, what do they do? They sit in the back and go, well, that ain't going to last. When somebody testifies and says, God healed this and God did that, they're like, yeah, we'll check with you next week. We're going to see that more and more. And more, this religious, jealous spirit that is going. And, and I'm not. I'm not. Sh- I'm not telling you this so that you get all excited and say, "Oh, praise God, we're going to win this." I- I'm telling you this because I want you to be ready, because the attack is happening. The attack. I have. I have a new friend in Pakistan, <clears throat> and uh, I met him through Facebook Messenger. I meet a lot of people that way. 
uh, usually they just want money, you know, and it always sounds good because they're holding like 15 kids, that's their orphanage, you know, send money or we're all going to die if you don't send your money. And, uh, and this guy's not that way. He, he sent me a message and he watches us, he might be watching, probably watching this, they're the opposite time of the day, it's night there, but later on today he'll be watching this, this, this sermon and he sent me this message, and he said, man, I just love what, what God is doing in you and in your life. And, 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 you know, I'm like, well, man, you know, God is just gracious because I don't deserve anything that God has done in my life. And he said, I want you to meet my brother. And so he, he takes his little iPhone, it's video chat, and he, he, his brother's over there, and he goes, my, my brother's a guitar player. And his brother says, I don't play the guitar, I'm terrible at it. He goes, but I, I can't sing. And he just started worshiping God in song. And man, the Spirit of God just fell. He's, he's halfway around the world. Spirit of God just fell as he was singing. And, and, and as, as the Spirit of God was just coming down, man, I just began to cry and just weep because I just like, God, I don't deserve this moment. God, I, I know that you're great. I know that you're amazing, but I don't even deserve this. But God is moving around the world. And so he's like, man, you gotta, you, I want you to come. I want you to come to Pakistan. I'm like, I'm like well... <clears throat> You know, that, i got to be honest with you. Don't they kill people in Pakistan for Christ, being Christians? <laughs> he goes, well, yeah, some places. Well, I'm not coming then, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, how do I know if we're going to be in that place, you know? I mean, it's just, there's, there's already persecution. There's always been persecution. But we've got to, we've got to realize God's called us. To be world changers. Come on, tell yourself again. Say, I'm a world changer. See, the truth is you can go anywhere God sends you and be protected. And if you're not protected and somehow something happens, God gets the glory. Oh, that revival would spark through you. Oh, that revival would happen through me. Oh, that my heart would be, God, I just want to serve you, and I want to see your mercy. I want to see your grace. I want to see these things that Jonah knew about you. I want to see those happen. I want to, I want to be there when somebody bows their knee and, and God radically fills them with the Holy Ghost. I don't want to be the guy sitting in the corner saying, well, I bet that's the fake Holy Ghost. I don't want to be the one that's the negative one that's always expecting the worst. I, we, what we need in this world today is the good news. That's what the gospel means, the good news of Jesus. Jonah whines and complains. His, his complaint is of God's mercy. God saves this city. You know, after Jonah chapter 4, we don't hear of Jonah anymore kind of rhymes. After Jonah chapter 4, we don't hear of Jonah anymore. <laughs> anyway, I'm holding back right now. I know. Anyway, I, I just, I don't want us to be Jonah. Our world doesn't need Jonas. They need Jesus. Oh, that we would be Jesus to the world. Oh, that we would weep over the things that God weeps over. Oh, that we would we would rejoice when a sinner bows his knee. Oh, that when somebody reads a verse and maybe they miss it up and they try to quote it. And we're not the ones to, to bring correction every time and say, oh, wow, well, you sure messed that up. I remember when I first started preaching. You, you don't even know. You don't even know what happens. You first start preaching, people, people feel like that their calling is to write down every time you said Noah instead of Moses. And quick, you know, you get off the stage and you're like, whoo. So glad I got that over with. Praise God. You know, the burden's kind of lifted, and then you run right into another burden. You run right into Jonah, and you want to throw him overboard again. <laughs> what we need in our world today is some Jesus. What, we, what, what your neighbor needs is not 
you should explain to them all the evil things that you've seen them do on the weekend. They need to see the Jesus in you. Could you stand with me today? I want you to bow your heads. <clears throat> and I want you to look inside. Is there an identity? Is there a robe that I'm wearing? A robe of maybe, maybe even intellect. You know, in the, in the Garden of Eden, what messed up Adam and Eve is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me say that again. What got them kicked out of heaven was their disobedience, but what they disobeyed God in was getting to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As you stand there with your head bowed, ask yourself, what's wrong with, what's, what's wrong with knowing what's right and wrong? What's wrong with the knowledge of knowing what's right and wrong? What's wrong with it? It's because when we, start, when we start operating in what's right and wrong, we become God. Instead of letting God lead us and guide us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isn't that what it says? Doesn't it say something like, he leads me beside still waters? You see, when we're, when we're truly, fall, when we've taken off our identity, when we've taken off our robe of being the shepherd, of being the boss, of being in charge, when we take off that robe, when we quit being in, when, when, we're the, when we quit being the one that is determining what is right and what is wrong, and we let God determine what is right and what is wrong for us, and we just simply follow Him, it frees us. Lord, I pray Lord, that as we stand before you in your presence, that we would lay off that robe. Come on, I don't know what identity you hide in, trying to act like you got it all together. I don't know what's hidden in your closet. But just as you stand there, maybe... Maybe you need to actually move your arms, but just as a sign of surrender, just take it off. That we would be bare before the King. That we would remove any hindrance of the flow of the Spirit. That our walk with God would be the thing that we're after most is being low. Lord, I don't wanna, I don't wanna just get on YouTube and find someone else's message. Lord, I need a message from you. So I'm gonna take off this garment. I'm gonna take off this intellect. I'm gonna take off this this thing that that, that where I have to be right all the time. And I don't even know who I'm talking to in this room. I don't know who's listening today, but it's time for us to get low. So that I don't have to have my three favorite worship songs, but that the song comes up out of me, that I can sing a new song. I guess what I'm trying to get us to today, place of repentance, place of change. God, I surrender to you. I refuse to be in charge. Lord, I just want to follow you. Lord, I just release your presence in this room. Lord, in a great way. Lord, I just, I just release in this room freedom. Freedom, God, to be us. Lord, you know our flaws. You know our failures. You know the things we want to hide from you. God, today we just lay it down. We just bear it all before you. Lord, look inside of me. Remove the evil.
fill me up with the good. Lord, I want to remove the things, and I can't do it on my own. God, so I just have to surrender it to you. Did you do something for me? Can we just all kind of get down on our knees? If you're at home watching, just, just get down low before him. Just spend a few minutes saying, God, God, I surrender to you. I'm available to you. Lord, do with me whatever you want. Use me however you would like. Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, I just pray, God, for those that are watching online, Lord, for this, uh, those of us in this room, Lord, that we would find that place with you. Lord, that my identity comes from you, not from some garment that I wear. Unless it's the blood-soaked garment of heaven. Use me how you want to, God. Lord, I thank you. If we just begin to lift our hands and just give him adoration, Lord, we declare that you are God all alone. Lord, you don't need my help. You don't need my help to be God. God, you've got that. God, so I just surrender to the kingship. I say, lead me, God. Yes, Come on, ask him, God, would you lead me? Would you guide me, God? I surrender to you. I don't know what my tomorrow looks like. It doesn't matter. God, as long as you're in it and I'm following you, Lord, we surrender today to you. We surrender in a greater form, in a greater fashion, so that I would give you all of me. In Jesus' name. Change me. Change this world. This little world, this little universe in me that I think I'm the, the, I'm the center of. God, change me. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 